I was a uh, subcontractor on a USDA project, and a, a large consulting firm brought me in. They had problems with customers. Uh, in that, the customer didn't like them, and they were having problems interacting and engaging with the customer, which, uh, from my background, uh, growing up in a small business in Michigan, understanding the, the, the fundamental fact of life that the customer is always right, even when they're wrong, the customer's right, they're paying the bill. Um, I, fir I firmly believe that. And coming into government to solve that problem for a large consulting firm, who clearly didn't understand that, uh, was interesting. And engaging with an agency, at that time I was, uh, I don't know, maybe 10 years ago, uh, engaging with an agency CIO and CTO, who was very clear that I, they liked me more than they did the contractor. Uh, I was able to get things done that the contractor was not, simply because they refused to listen to the, cu the customer. Uh, clearly a case of the tail wagging the dog. And uh, really fundamentally understanding in that role that you have outside forces driving innovation in government. When the government has a clear role as stewards of the taxpayer's money and ensuring that taxpayers get what they need, not what an outside consultant says they need. And that's sort of the lesson I took away from that, which was the, it's about the customer. And the customer ultimately is or are my parents down in Naples, Florida, who pay their tax bill. They need to know why it is we're doing some fundamental scientific research and why we're producing a piece of software and how it affects their life. Not because a large consulting firm says this is what needs to be done. That's not the way we should do, do business. Um, I don't want government to push solutions to market that are driven by external forces that are not um, not doing it for the best good of the taxpayers. I made some decisions early in my career uh, to do a couple of things. One, uh, I wanted to be in the technology space. And I don't have a technology degree. For all of those out there who think that you have to have one to be in the space, that's not necessarily correct. Uh, I have a political science, political economics background. Uh, I wrote books for the AARP on healthcare. Uh, I made the decision to uh, go deep into technology based on the fact that I, I like, I, I'm a lover of technology. It's, it is my passion. I have many computers and all of this. Uh, they, uh, once I decided to do that, and I said that's where I wanted to be, it's what I wanted to do, I found that I really wanted to do technology, but I wasn't going to be a green screen coder. Uh, I can do it. The last languages I you know, coded in were procedural based languages. Uh, now we're in you know, object oriented and beyond. Uh, so if you want COBOL, I'm your guy. And if you want you know, JSON, not me. So they, uh, I made the decision that I, I was going to be smart about technology and understanding how to use those languages, but I also want to be in the front office. And I never looked back. Uh, it was sort of following the passion, deciding to do that. I was fairly high in my career at that time on the technology side, really being in the web development space. And I made a conscious decision to step back and take a significant cut in career, whether by money or position or role, to go to front office. And uh, it took time to rebuild after that, but the net is I'm where I want to be. Uh, when I think about, some people ask me, what are you going to do you know, now? You're a chief technology officer. And I'm you know, 43 years old. And I look at them straight in the eye and say, I'm doing exactly what I want to do. I can't imagine a better job. Uh, the intersection of, of business, policy, technology, it's all here. This is the top of the ladder for a propeller head, a super geek. And you can take it a bunch of different ways, but that's really where you want to be. You want to be dri you know, driving your career in such a way that you're following your passion. I see a lot of young people in the federal government, and I see in the Department of Energy, we have a, a very large number of highly educated young individuals astrophysicists that are working in fellowship roles. And I asked them the you know, same question we just talked about, which was, do you really want to do this? You're an astrophysicist. You understand what a wormhole is. What are you doing here helping me do mobile application development? Do you really want to be here? And it, it gets to the question of a gut check for that individual to have them understand that they've got to want to be here. This isn't a job for me. This is what I do. This is me. 
are you part of that? Do you really want to be there? And for some of these younger folks who are still trying to figure out that direction, we all took our time um, to find direction in our lives. Um, I'd really like to see younger individuals getting the counsel before they leave college to be aggressive, to make some determination and you know, take some risk, start, try different things. And maybe that astrophysicist is at DOE specifically to try different things. And I, and I, I give them credit for doing that because it isn't easy to go someplace that you are you know, giving up what you know to go someplace else where you are at the bottom of the rung, the bottom of the ladder. That takes courage. Uh, but I want to give them good counsel to say, look, don't be afraid. Uh, step into it. Don't be afraid to turn around and shake hands with an assistant secretary or a secretary. They're just a person like you. Yeah, they got a bodyguard. Okay, great. Yeah, they got a fancy title, an S1, whatever. But at the end of the day, they work just like you. They work hard. They're here to do a job. And so are you. Do your job. Focus on the task in front of you. Uh, don't let the overwhelming amount of process, the many, many made up words in government, uh, I guarantee you there's an entire lexicon of words that are not in the dictionary, abridged or unabridged, or even uh, you know, some of the other urban dictionaries out there. Uh, and I find them every day, and I look at people cross-eyed, and I will tell them that's not a word. Just, we just figure it out. And don't be afraid. Uh, I, I, you know, I, I do get a little bit angry with young people who shirk from the table. They sit, they sit on the wall. And clearly there are times when you don't get a seat at the table. When everybody up here at the table is a secretary or above, well, okay, even the CTO sits at the wall. But if there's an open seat, get your butt up there. Don't be afraid. Worst case scenario, someone's going to look at you and say, oh, that's for you know, chief whatever. Okay. But most of the time, these guys and girls that are up at the table are in the same place at one point in their life. They're going to give you that opportunity. And they're going to look for you to engage. Ask a question. Are there dumb questions? Absolutely. But no one's going to fault you for asking a question. And I want them to engage. The best one I, I've ever received certainly comes from my father, and that is do your job. Focus. Do your job, the job you're there to do. Um, sometimes your job may not be what you want to do at that moment. It may be hard. It may be ugly. You know, dark and slimy, whatever it is. Do your job. Don't be afraid to, you know, to sit there and go, I don't like this job. It's hard. I'm going to avoid it. I'm going to procrastinate. We're all guilty of procrastination. Sooner or later, you've got to do your job. Uh, I had a, a young nephew one, uh, who was commenting about procrastination and, and deciding you know, how to move forward on, on a job and do something. And I, and, I, and I counseled him in the clear on Facebook, and I'm sure the wall post is somewhere in the other. I said, sooner or later, uh, Tommy is his name, somebody has to put their hand in the garbage disposal to get the wedding ring out. It is dark, it is cold, it is slimy, and there's a blade in there that can chop your fingertips off. But sooner or later, someone's got to put a hand in there to get that thing out. And the longer you think about it, the worse it gets. So do your job. Put your hand in the garbage disposal and get the ring before it's chopped up and gone. It's a different environment today than it's ever been for kids, people looking for a job. Um, it's very difficult, highly competitive. There are a lot of jobs out there, but getting yourself noticed in the, in the stack that anybody will receive in terms of, uh, uh, of resumes or CVs um, is very difficult. Leveraging your network, and not just your email network, uh, not just your Facebook or your LinkedIn network or your Twitter streams, whatever that may be, leverage all of those, absolutely. But also leverage what I will call your campfire network. The people you know, you see, the people you've gone out to lunch with, the, the, the friends and family who have a job and are advanced in their careers. Uh, someone once said it, to me, if you've got the juice, use it. And if you know somebody who's got the juice, use it. It's a, it's a chance. It's an opportunity. And then it falls on you to take advantage of that opportunity. They, someone that you know might be able to get you in front of somebody that can help you get a job. Um, I think some people are afraid, younger folks that come out of college, they think that they, they, they've got their degree, they want to get out, they immediately want to go hit the pavement and start making money. Well, we all do. But some of them think that, well, I can't get a job in my field in communications, so I'm going to go be a waiter. Okay, at least you're making money paying your bills, but that's not going to do much for you getting a career. 
Is that really what you want to be? Maybe what you need to consider doing is go get an internship. Go get a fellowship. Get real world business experience leveraging, maybe you got a family member that works for a company and you can get an internship for the summer. Go live with them in San Francisco for three months. They'll put you up. At least you got real world experience. And so your next job interview, you can say, I was doing a job that mattered, that had significant, uh, it, it significantly increased my capacity to do the job I really want to do. I learned how to fix a, a printer, for God's sakes, if that's what it is. The opportunity to do good works, plural, with a clear conscience. I can't, it's, it's wonderful to know that I can go into work every day and I have a clear conscience about what I do. Um, I, I, it's, it's, it's the ability to love your job for the value that you do to your company, in this case a federal agency, or your office, the agency, the nation, and the taxpayers. Uh, it feels really good. And when someone's thinking about coming into, you know, I'm going to get out of college, I'm going to go do work. In my world, the Department of Energy, uh, Energy Efficiency, it's about applied sciences. And there's a theoretical science as well, but applied. And you know, the opportunity to go do work you know, in the government space, maybe for one of our labs, wow. Uh, there is um, you know, something I tell folks is that you know, the Department of Energy, we do science fiction every day. Wicked cool stuff, quantum encryption, Big data, someone was talking about big data, and I, and I just want to basically take them and pull them into a room and say, I'll show you big data. I think 89 billion points of data coming from smart grid pilots. What are you going to do with that? You know, and I'm sure the DOD structures have vaster amounts. Uh, jars of green goo that make drop in fuels for trucks, battleships even. What an amazing job to do. And if you were a scientist being able to do this, wow. What if you're a, a computational scientist and you have an opportunity to model uh, electricity infrastructures and generation development? Wow, what an opportunity to build those algorithms into a piece of software. Holy moly, I would love to do that. Um, in my role, I, you know, I'm way past the capacity to do that kind of you know, recycle electron bits on a screen coding anymore. However, I understand it fundamentally. Someone comes to me and says, I want to do something with computational fluid dynamics. Okay, I know what that is, and I can spell the words, uh, mostly. And, but what I do know is I know where to find the experts that do know what that is, know the three fundamental equations for computational fluid dynamics. And then I can assess the value in concert with them of, well, what if I wanted to do a software development challenge on this? That's cool. Super science. What if we were going to build uh, and do this all in open source? and leverage the beauty that are, you know, th th that is the world of open ecologies and open source software developments, possibly with varying degrees of copyleft restrictions, who knows. That's, that's in incredible stuff. And to be able to do it for mission-driven stuff, whether it's advanced manufacturing or wind and hydropower or what have you, that's exciting.